A warm welcome to all of you. Good afternoon. Uh, today and also yesterday, uh, the Netherlands Bank had the honor of hosting the ECB's Governing Council here in Amsterdam. It was the first time in 20 years that the Governing Council came to the Netherlands again. Today is also the first time that the ECB hosts this press conference again in physical format, and I hope it will add to the joy. Thank you. Over to you, Wolfgang. Thank you very much, Governor Knut. Uh, we are also joined here on stage by President Lagarde and by Vice President De Guindos. This is a hybrid meeting, and for those who join us remotely, I would like to ask you, as always, uh, to turn your camera and your microphones if you ask questions. I will now give the floor to President Lagarde. President Lagarde, please. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, and thank you so much, Klaus. It's a real pleasure uh, being here in Amsterdam, but we'll come to that later. Let me first wish you all in the room a good afternoon as well. The Vice President and myself welcome you to our press conference. I would like to thank President Knott for his kind hospitality and express our special gratitude to his staff and uh, for the excellent organization of today's meeting of the Governing Council. High inflation is a major challenge for all of us. The Governing Council will make sure that inflation returns to our 2% target over the medium term. In May, inflation again rose significantly, mainly because of surging energy and food prices, including due to the impact of the war. But inflation pressures have broadened and intensified with prices for many goods and services increasingly strongly. Eurosystem staff have revised their baseline inflation projections up significantly. These projections indicate that inflation will remain undesirably elevated for some time. However, moderating energy costs the easing of supply disruptions related to the pandemic and the normalization of monetary policy are expected to lead to a decline in inflation. The new staff projections foresee annual inflation at 6.8% in 2022, before it is projected to decline to 3.5% in 2023 and 2.1% in 2024, higher than in the March projections. This means that headline inflation at the end of the projection horizon is projected to be slightly above our target. Inflation, excluding energy and food, is projected to average 3.3% in 2022, 2.8% in 2023, and 2.3% in 2024, also above the March projections. Russia's unjustified aggression towards Ukraine continues to weigh on the economy in Europe and beyond. It is disrupting trade, is leading to shortages of materials, and is contributing to high energy and commodity prices. These factors will continue to weigh on confidence and dampen growth, especially in the near term. However, the conditions are in place for the economy to continue to grow on account of the ongoing reopening of the economy, a strong labor market, fiscal support, and savings built up during the pandemic. Once current headwinds abate, economic activity is expected to pick up again. The out this outlook is broadly reflected in the Eurosystem staff projections which foresee annual real GDP growth at 2.8% in 22, 2.1% in 23, and 2.1% in 24. Compared with the March projections, the outlook has been revised down significantly for 22 and 23, while for 24 it has been revised up. On the basis of our updated assessment, we decided to take further steps in normalizing our monetary policy. 
Throughout this process, the Governing Council will maintain optionality, data dependence, gradualism, and flexibility in the conduct of monetary policy. First, we decided to end net asset purchases under our asset purchase program as of July 1, 2022. The Governing Council intends to continue reinvesting in full the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the APP for an extended period of time past the date when it starts raising the key ECB interest rates, and in any case, for as long as necessary, to maintain ample liquidity conditions and an appropriate monetary policy stance. Second, we undertook a careful review of the conditions which, according to our forward guidance, should be satisfied before we start raising the key ECB interest rates. As a result of this assessment, the Governing Council concluded that those conditions have been satisfied. Accordingly, and in line with our policy sequencing, we intend to raise the key ECB interest rates by 25 basis points at our July monetary policy meeting. Looking further ahead, we expect to raise the key ECB interest rates again in September. The calibration of this rate increase will depend on the updated medium-term inflation outlook. If the medium-term inflation outlook persists or deteriorates, a larger increment will be appropriate at our September meeting. Third, beyond September, based on our current assessment, we anticipate that a gradual but sustained path of further increases in interest rates will be appropriate. In line with our commitment to our 2% medium-term target, the pace at which we adjust our monetary policy will depend on the incoming data and how we assess inflation to develop in the medium term. Within the Governing Council's mandate, under stressed conditions, flexibility will remain an element of monetary policy whenever threats to monetary policy transmission jeopardize the attainment of price stability. The decisions taken today are set out in full in a press release available on our website. I will now outline in more detail how we see the economy and inflation developing and will then explain our assessment of financial and monetary conditions. Looking at the economic activity, in the near term, we expect activity to be dampened by high energy costs the deterioration in the terms of trade, greater uncertainty, and the adverse impact of high inflation on disposable income. The war in Ukraine and renewed pandemic restrictions in China have made supply bottlenecks worse again. As a result, firms face higher costs and disruptions in their supply chains, and their outlook for future output has deteriorated. However, there are also factors supporting economic activity, and these are expected to strengthen over the months to come. The reopening of those sectors most affected by the pandemic and a strong labor market with more people in jobs will continue to support incomes and consumption. In addition, savings accumulated during the pandemic are a buffer. Fiscal policy is helping to cushion the impact of the war. Targeted and temporary budgetary measures protect those people bearing the brunt of higher energy prices while limiting the risk of adding to inflationary pressures. The swift implementation of the investment and structural reform plans under the Next Generation EU programme, the Fit for 55 package and the Repower EU plan would also help the euro area economy to grow faster in a sustainable manner and become more resilient to global, global shocks. 
Looking at inflation now, inflation rose further to 8.1% in May. Although governments have intervened and have helped slow energy inflation, energy prices stand 39.2% above their levels one year ago. Market-based indicators suggest that global energy prices will stay high in the near term, but will then moderate to some extent. Food prices rose 7.5% in May, in part reflecting the importance of Ukraine and Russia among the main global producers of agricultural goods. Prices have also gone up strongly because of renewed supply bottlenecks and because of recovering domestic demand, especially in the services sector, as our economy reopens. Price rises are becoming more widespread across sectors. Accordingly, measures of underlying inflation have been rising further. The labour market continues to improve, with unemployment remaining at its historical low of 6.8% in April. Job vacancies across many sectors show that there is robust demand for labour. Wage growth, including in forward-looking indicators, has started to pick up. Over time, the strengthening of the economy and some catch-up effects should support faster growth in wages. While most measures of longer-term inflation expectations derived from financial markets and from expert surveys stand at around 2%, initial signs of above-target revisions in those measures warrant close monitoring. Let's turn to the risk assessment. Risks relating to the pandemic have declined, but the war continues to be a significant downside risk to growth. In particular, a major risk would be a further disruption in the energy supply to the euro area, as reflected in the downside scenario included in the staff projections. Furthermore, if the war were to escalate, economic sentiment could worsen, supply-side constraints could increase, and energy and food costs could remain persistently higher than expected. The risks surrounding inflation are primarily on the upside. The risks to the medium-term inflation outlook include a durable worsening of the production capacity of our economy, persistently high energy and food prices, inflation expectations rising above our target, and higher than anticipated wage rises. However, if demand were to weaken over the medium term, it would lower pressures on prices. Let's have a look now at the financial and the monetary conditions. Market interest rates have increased in response to the changing outlook for inflation and monetary policy. With benchmark interest rates rising, bank funding costs have increased, and this has fed into higher bank lending rates, in particular for households. Nevertheless, lending to firms picked up in March, and this was because of the continued need to finance investment and working capital against the backdrop of increasing production costs, persisting supply bottlenecks, and lower reliance on market funding. Lending to households also increased, reflecting continued robust demand for mortgages. In line with our monetary policy strategy, the Governing Council has undertaken its biannual in-depth assessment of the interrelation between monetary policy and financial stability. The environment for financial stability has worsened since our last review in December 21, especially over the short term. In particular, lower growth and increasing cost pressures, as well as rising risk-free rates and sovereign bond yields, could lead to a further deterioration in the financing conditions faced by borrowers. At the same time, tighter financing conditions could reduce some existing financial stability vulnerabilities 
over the medium term. Banks, which started the year with solid capital positions and improving asset quality, are now facing greater credit risk. We will watch these factors closely. In any case, macroprudential policy remains the first line of defense in preserving financial stability and addressing medium-term vulnerabilities. So, summing up, Russia's unjustified aggression towards Ukraine is severely affecting the euro area economy and the outlook is still surrounded by high uncertainty. But the conditions are in place for the economy to continue to grow and to recover further over the medium term. Inflation is undesirably high and is expected to remain above our target for some time. We will make sure that inflation returns to our 2% target over the medium term. Accordingly, we decided to take further steps in normalizing our monetary policies. The calibration of our policies will remain data dependent and reflect our evolving assessment of the outlook. We stand ready to adjust all of our instruments within our mandate, incorporating flexibility if warranted to ensure that inflation stabilizes at our 2% target over the medium term. We are now ready to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, President Lagarde. And the first question goes to Cor Caroline Look of uh, Bloomberg News. Caroline, please. Good afternoon, President Lagarde. Good I have afternoon. two questions. Um, Firstly, one argument that you've made uh, rather frequently over the last few months is that the euro area economy is in a very different place than other advanced economies. Um, and even so, three months after the Fed started rising, raising interest rates, you are now looking to start doing the same. So is this still about a difference or are we talking more about a delay at this point? And mm -hmm. second of all, could you tell us a little bit about um, whether this week's discussion uh, focused at all on fragmentation risks and whether there were any new proposals made to address them? Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, the Governing Council on the occasion of this meeting organized outside of Frankfurt in beautiful Amsterdam, thanks to uh, the National Central Bank of the Netherlands, um, focused primarily on the challenge of high inflation facing the euro area and on taking further steps in our normalization path that we started, I remind you, back in December. So, it's not a question of um, catching up. It's a question of using all the tools that we have in order to deliver on our mandate of price stability and in order to bring inflation down to target over the medium term. And our analysis was obviously that inflation was, as we said, undesirably high and uh, that we had to take the steps that uh, I have identified in the uh, monetary policy statement. And I would like to add that it's not just a step, it's a journey. We started back in December we gradually, over the course of time, put ourselves in a position to move away from unconventional monetary policy, which will actually be taking place uh, as of the 1st of July, in order to use more conventional tools, which are the interest rates. And on the issue of the interest rates, we also identified a path which is not only limited to a particular move, but a series of moves over the course of the next few months, depending on the medium-term outlook of inflation. On the second issue, um, we have to have the right monetary policy stance that is critically important, and that is what we are doing with that uh, identification of the journey that I just mentioned, but we also have to make sure that our monetary policy is transmitted throughout the entire um, 
euro area. And to that end, obviously, we need to make sure that uh, there is no fragmentation that would prevent the adequate monetary policy transmission throughout the entire region. We have existing instrument. I think that we have described them uh, in the past. It is obviously the reinvestment capacity that we have under the PEP, which is, uh, I remind you, uh, a complete reinvestment package that totals 1.7 uh, trillion euros that will be reinvested with total flexibility if warranted across time, across jurisdictions, across products. And if it is necessary, as we have amply demonstrated in the past, we will deploy either existing adjusted instruments or new instruments that will be made available. But we are committed, committed to proper transmission of our monetary policy, and as a result, fragmentation will indeed be avoided to the extent that it would impair that transmission. Thank you, President. The next question goes to Mark Boindermann of uh, NRC Hansblatt over here. Thank you, President Lagarde. Um, uh, my first question is uh, whether uh, today's decision was unanimous. Could you give us a flavor of the, of the discussion? And uh, secondly, um, the ECB is now communicated, <coughs> communicating that uh, in September it could raise rates by more than uh, a quarter of a percentage point. Did you consider already uh, giving that message for the uh, July meeting? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your question. Um, and as I said, we had very productive um, discussions in Amsterdam. And these discussions concluded with a unanimously approved decision. And as I said, it's, it's a, we are on a journey, but this is clearly an important step in that journey, given that we are actually deciding uh, to end net asset purchases under the APP as of the 1st of July, which effectively means that we stopped before for all sorts of market operation conditions. But we are also um, setting a path in which July and then September are the next first steps along the way of hiking interest rates. And while we intend to raise interest rates by 25 basis point in July on the basis of the assessment that we conducted today, we also indicate that, and I will read very carefully for you because it was obviously a sentence that we um, drafted carefully in order to capture our commitment. We also indicated that – I'll read you the whole paragraph, actually, because it's a, it's a really uh, important one. So we undertook a, a careful review of the conditions, which according to our forward guidance – you all remember the forward guidance with the three conditions – should be satisfied before we start raising the key ECB interest rates. Well, we concluded that these three conditions were satisfied. And accordingly, in line with our policy sequencing – for those of you who wonder why we didn't do it today – well, we have a sequencing in place that dictates – and we want to be predictable on that front – that we first of all stop net asset purchases and then we look at interest rate hikes. So in accordance with our policy sequencing, we intend to raise the key ECB interest rates by 25 basis points at our July monetary policy meeting. And that's the September that you were asking me about. Looking further ahead, we expect to raise the key ECB interest rates again in September. The calibration of this rate increase will depend on the updated medium-term inflation outlook. If the medium-term inflation outlook persists or deteriorates, a larger increment will be appropriate at our September meeting. That is pretty precise as a commitment, but it is also a factor of how the situation evolves. So if the medium-term outlook persists as we see it now, or even deteriorates, which of course we don't wish, but it could happen, then obviously the increment will be, will be higher than 25. 
Um, and then we go further because we take a third step along that journey to indicate what we will do beyond September, which is also the anticipation that further rates hikes will be necessary uh, on the basis of the data that we, that we collect. Thank you. Thank you, President Lagarde. And the next question goes to Bart Meyers of uh, Reuters. Bart, please. Here. You get a microphone. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Bart Meyer, for uh, Reuters. Um, so just to make that uh, perfectly clear, uh, follow up on your last answer, um, does that mean that if the um, inflation outlook um, is not cut back down to 2%, that we will see a, uh, a, 50, a 50 basis point increase in September? Um, and secondly, um, on the... Um, the fragmentation. Um, no, I'm sorry, I lost that question. Um, what I wanted to ask. That Take your time. You will find it. Yes. No. Uh, that's all right. Um, you said that you wanted to increase um, the rates by September. Does that mean all three rates? Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't want to give a, a reading exercise because some of you occasionally comment on the fact that I read too much, but this one I really want to read it a bit because it, it matters and every word matters, including plural versus singular, to your point. So what we say is, looking further ahead, we, so today we say that, we expect to raise the key ECB interest rates, the three of them, again in September, most likely. The calibration of this rate increase will depend on the updated medium-term inflation outlook. And here is the important one. If the medium-term inflation outlook persists or deteriorates, a larger increment will be appropriate at our September meeting. So I think that you took the example of if uh, you are at 2.1% in 2024 or beyond, then the increment adjustment will be higher. The answer is yes. Thank you, President Lagarde. And the next question goes to Annette Weisbach of CNBC. Annette, please, here in the, in the middle. President Lagarde, thank you very much for taking my question. I have one on um, what are you expecting in terms of time lag? If you raise rates in July, when will you see an effect on inflation and inflation expectations? And will that ultimately also mean that you have to lift rates to a neutral rate? And that would be my second question, because I think there's a lot of guessing around what you think the neutral rate actually is. Is it 1.5? Is it 2% for the euro area? Um, perhaps you could give us a bit more of an insight. Thank you. So do we expect that our July uh, interest rate hikes will have an immediate effect on inflation? The answer to that is no. And I would like to develop that a little bit. First of all, because of the anticipation of our monetary policy, because of the inflation and growth outlook, Financing costs have already moderately but significantly increased, whether you look at corporate bonds, whether you look at sovereign bonds, whether you look at um, bank, of course. Uh, those, those financing costs have increased. And with the signal that we're giving here, particularly concerning the short-term rates, this signal will continue to have an impact on financing costs. Now, typically, monetary policy uh, decisions have a longer term impact in relation to inflation itself. So we have to stay the course, be determined, committed to delivering the 2%. But we cannot expect that to happen on the uh, 22nd of August for a decision that, sorry, 22nd of July for a decision that we would have made in July. On the other hand, because you mentioned inflation expectations, we observe that inflation expectations are well anchored. And we certainly want to indicate to those who form expectations, whether they're markets, whether they are uh, experts, whether they're consumers, that we are determined to delivering on our target of 2% in the medium term. And therefore, expectations 
should absolutely remain anchored because we will deliver. Oh, the neutral rate. This is, this is a topic that we have deliberately decided not to have on the occasion of this governing council meeting. And I'm sure that we will, at nauseum, argue as to whether it is 0 0.96 or 1.97 uh, or beyond or below or whatever. Suffice to say that the neutral rate over the course of time for multiple reasons, having to do with productivity, with demographics and all the rest of it, has gone down. But where it stands exactly, we have decided not to discuss it on this governing council meeting. And believe me, we had plenty to discuss. So we, we saved a little bit for later. And you know, to be fair as well, it's, it's not something that you can observe and determine with precision today. Is as you get closer, uh, we will understand better where exactly st it stands. And we will debate it. I have no illusion on that. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question goes to Dan Balacher of uh, Volkskrant. Dan, please. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking my question. Um, is the end of the asset purchasing program a good time for you maybe to adjust the forward guiding uh, policy? Uh, because when it was introduced in, in 2013, it was meant to manage market expectations. But now it, it seems like the ECB would have stopped the purchases earlier, if not for the promises made, even though there was a, an extraordinary inflation-inducing event like the war in Ukraine. I, is the tail, financial markets, not wagging the dog, the ECB, instead of the other way around? My second question is related to this one. The ECB believes inflation will fall down back to target by 2024, but for most of the past decade, the ECB also consistently thought that the inflation rate, which was then too low, of course, would converge to its target, and that also didn't happen. So how firm are your beliefs that you are going to succeed now as historical experiences do not imply great credibility? Mm. First of all, um, on the issue of forward guidance, I'm assuming that you're referring to the forward guidance uh, relating to asset purchases. Yeah. So if you look at that uh, forward guidance, we have actually changed it. If you recall, uh, the forward guidance that we had referred to um, favorable financing conditions and to uh, uh, accommodative, uh, there was a qualifier as well, but it referred to the accommodative aspect of our monetary policy. We have changed that. And if you look at the third paragraph on the first, on the second page, we do refer to the fact that we, um, we will do so for as long as necessary to maintain ample, not favorable, ample liquidity conditions and an appropriate monetary policy stance. So we take account of the change that has indeed taken place. And, and you're right, we are in a different universe. A lot of the, the tools, the forward guidance, uh, the, the, the considerations uh, over the last 11 years uh, had to do with exactly the opposite movement, trying to bring inflation up because it was too low and often at risk of deflation. Uh, now we are in the opposite situation where inflation is too high and we need to bring it back uh, to our target of 2% over the medium term. Now, how confident are we uh, about our projections? First of all, I'd like to say that our staff uh, does the best work they can do and apply their whole consciousness and, and, and uh, uh, professionalism to producing those projections. Second, those projections are not just the ECB. The projections that you have in front of you are the projections of the entire euro system. So it's the ECB and 19 national central banks, including the Great Bank of the Netherlands, which has actively and always actively participates in this exercise. So it's, it's, a, it's a cohesive work that is done, that is tedious, that is iterative, and that really checks everything. Third, it is clear that um, the massive energy prices hike and the war in Ukraine and the, 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 the fast pace of the recovery um, have taken all uh, forecasters by surprise. You know, I, I actually, I thought you would ask me a question like that. So what did I do? I looked at other, um, I hope I can find it now. Anyway, it doesn't really matter if I don't find it. The point being that all international institutions, 
all forecasters of repute have actually made the same mistake uh, of underestimating or not anticipating some of the developments such as the war, such as the energy crisis. Fourth point, I think we are, we the, the euro system and the ECB in particular, we are the only central bank which has gone back to the work that was done, which has uh, looked under every stone to understand where the errors came from. And I use the word errors with some trepidation because it's, it's misforecasting caused by very unpredictable events. Three quarters of the forecasting errors is actually attributable to energy prices. And the rest is largely attributable to bottlenecks that have lasted longer than had been anticipated. So, again, they do everything they can as well as they can. They make the same kind of forecast as other international institutions. Events that have developed are not captured in either models or sometimes just the sheer imagination of us all when we talk about the war at the doorstep of Europe. And fourth, we do the uh, you know, introspective exercise of trying to find out where it went wrong, and we will continue doing so in the future, because we have to improve, no question. Thank you. And the next question goes to Mark Schroers um, of Börsenzeitung. Mark, please. Yes, thanks for taking my questions. Um, the first one is on reinvestments. Um, in the past, you've stressed several times the importance of the stock of assets compared to the flow. Um, now you have reaffirmed to reinvest, especially the PEP per, uh, payments, principal payments, at least until the end of 2024. That means a huge monetary stimulus for years. Is that appropriate if you, at the same time, are talking about normalizing monetary policy? Um, and the second one, just for, for clarification, why do you today already exclude a 50 basis point hike in July? On the, uh, on the reinvestment um, policy that we decided for PEP and for the APP, both of them eh, will, be, will now be operative uh, as of the 1st of July for APP and has already begun for, for PEP. It is a matter that we will be discussing within the Governing Council, which we have decided not to debate today. We had, as I said, plenty to do already uh, in the last couple of days, but we will be looking at it. And I have to tell you something. There are some of us on the Governing Council who will be interested not only to deploy flexibility, uh, if warranted, on classes of assets, by jurisdictions, over temporality, but some of us are also interested in looking at how we can support the financing of the measures needed against climate change. I said already before that a green LTRO was interesting to consider. I think the reinvestment uh, decisions that we will make in the coming months and years might also be inspired by this concern that we have. Okay? So that's point number one. Uh, your point number two is, why not 15 July? Well, we are coming out of 11 years of no interest rate move. We are on our path to exit negative interest rates soon. It is good practice, and it is actually often done by most central banks around the world, to start with an incremental increase that is sizable, not excessive, and that indicates a path. As I said, the decision that we have made today are not just one intention of one single month of July. It's a whole journey that will take us back to the 2% uh, target in the medium term. We also want to observe how markets are going to operate. And as I have mentioned, we couple our July determination with our September indication. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, uh, Martin Arnold. I think you raised your hand off the Financial Times. I did. Thank you for taking my, uh, my two questions. Um, 
Hello, uh, Madam Malagard. Uh, could I ask, first of all, like, is this announcement today a signal that you are dropping gradual normalization uh, in preference for a whatever it takes approach to tackling um, undesirably elevated inflation? And, and secondly, could I, um, could I ask on uh, tackling fragmentation that you mentioned earlier, the new instruments that could be designed and launched, would those uh, only be designed and launched once the existing instruments, i.e. PEP reinvestments, have been fully utilized? Thank you. I want to take you back to um, the monetary policy statement because I think that the key principles that we will uh, be inspired by in order to be predictable by you, but also uh, to set uh, the rules according to which uh, we will proceed, are captured on the top of page two and say the following. Throughout this process, the Governing Council will maintain optionality, data dependency, gradualism, and flexibility in the conduct of monetary policy. So, all four will matter, and there will be circumstances when one might be more important than another, and there might be other circumstances where the pecking order will change. So I think by doing that, we are trying to have as much optionality as we can, be able to use flexibility if and when warranted and necessary, be as data dependent as we have demonstrated and will continue to demonstrate, and also deploy the gradualism that will be appropriate given the circumstances. And I think in, terms, in times of great uncertainty, gradualism is probably appropriate more so than if the path is clear, well identified, and we all understand where we are heading. On the second issue, I just want to um, yet again come back to this issue of fragmentation, because I know that this is dear to some. I just want to reiterate that within our mandate, we are committed to preventing fragmentation risks in the euro area. Fragmented financial markets would obstruct the monetary policy transmission and undermine the possibility for the ECB to achieve its price stability mandate. And that's the reason we monitor constantly. And that is the reason we have available at hand the, all the dimensions of flexibility that can be applied to our reinvestment policies under the APP and, sorry, under the PEP because flexibility conditions are clearly associated with PEP to the extent that it relates to consequences of the pandemic. But we, as I said, we know how to design and we know how to deploy new instruments if and when necessary. We've demonstrated that in the past. We will do so again. Thank you. And the next question goes to Eric Albert uh, of Le Monde. Eric, please. Thank you very much for taking the question. Um, given the scale of the inflation, it's no surprise that the ECB is, is acting. Um, but still, could you explain, it's an inflation that's imported, that's mostly a tax on consumption, really. What can interest rate do un, uh, against this kind of, of inflation? And also, could you come back a little bit on why do you um, not expect too much of a risk of a recession? You, you did explain a little bit, but could you expand on that, please? Hmm. Well, thank you for your question. It is a case that a large portion of the inflation that we have analyzed is attributable either directly or indirectly to terms of trade, uh, what you call imported inflation, whether it is energy, um, exogenous bottlenecks, that, that is clearly uh, an so-called uh, imported inflation. But it's not it because we are clearly seeing uh, an unprecedented 75% of the items considered to measure inflation 
being above 2%. And that applies to uh, non-energy industrial goods, it applies to services, and it is partly a factor of the energy uh, passed through, but not only. Number two, we are also very attentive to wages, wage negotiations, and to the risk of uh, uh, second run effect and potential spiraling. We are not seeing uh, the risk of spiraling at all, but we are seeing uh, wage uh, increases that have picked up, uh, particularly since March, and that, as we indicated in the monetary policy statement, would not be entirely surprising, whether it is by way of catch-up effects or by way of general wage increase. We're also aware that Germany, for instance, will implement the minimum wage uh, as of October 1st. So it is largely, um, and, and certainly much more so than in the US, for instance, to come back to your questions about the difference between the EU and the US, it is more so imported inflation than it would be attributed to overheating demand, as is probably more so the case in the US. But it's, it's spreading uh, more broadly than, than, than uh, strictly speaking, in energy-related sectors. Um, and then, you, yeah, you had another question. You know, it's, it's a bit of a story of the hand, the current uh, situation of the economy. Uh, there is probably more of the uh, negative hand than the positive hand, but we have both. And on the negative front, we clearly have the continued impact of the war, in particular, uh, the uh, reactivation of lockdown measures in China, which went away, then are maybe slightly coming back, the bottlenecks impact that it, it induces and the dampening effect it has to mention the reduced disposable income that uh, some of the households are suffering. Um, but on the other hand, you have entire sectors of the economy that are recovering. And when you look at uh, the tourism industry, the accommodation industry, hospitality, those sectors are really uh, recovering at a fast pace. And, uh, you know, we looked at, uh, on a per-country basis, at the prices of, of hotels, of restaurants, of... It, it, is, it is clearly uh, on, it, on its way up with a strong demand in those, in those sectors in particular. And, and we cannot exclude also, we hope, we, we, you know, that remains to be seen, that some of the factors that have a dampening effect on growth will gradually fade um, a bit. Thank you. And the next question goes to Eshi Nielsen of uh, the New York Times. Eshi, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, you talked of raising all three key interest rates. Is the intention to keep the spread between those uh, consistent as they have been so far? Will that change uh, further into the future? And then my second question is on, can you talk a little bit more about the conditions that would trigger the flexibility within PEP? And do they have to be specific to the pandemic being the causes? Or could you say that actually... Um, consequences of the war in Ukraine or some other shock that we haven't envisioned yet could also encourage that flexibility usage. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. We, we said, in relation to the July um, rate hikes that, uh, that we discussed, we certainly considered that the three rates uh, would be impacted uh, by the hike, um, not just the DFR. For future references, as of September, we might also apply the principle of hikes to th the three, but we have not discussed that yet. And I think the intention will probably be to have a close look at that and to determine whether or not we want to just keep uh, those spreads or, or you know, return to a better symmetry uh, between those three. That's, that's clearly to be, to be debated uh, at either our next meeting or the September meeting. On the, uh, on the conditions that would trigger um, the anti-fragmentation. Let's be clear. <laughs> it, it, the, 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 the critical point is monetary policy transmission. And we are very attentive to make sure that it transmits throughout the entire euro area. So there is no uh, specific level of yields increase or lending rates or bond spreads that can unconditionally trigger this or that. Uh, the principle is that we will not tolerate fragmentation that would impair monetary policy transmission. And we will determine on the basis of circumstances of countries how and when that risk uh, is likely to materialize, and we will prevent it. Thank you very much. Um, 
I would like to turn now to Webex and take a question from a colleague in Frankfurt. Oh, we had forgotten Webex because you're all here, which is so much nicer. So, Andres Stumpf of Expansion, uh, your question, please. And please turn on your camera and your mic. Andres, for the time being, we can't hear anything. Can you hear me now? Yes, wonderful. Okay, I, I wasn't able to unmute myself. Uh, I have another question, uh, Madame Lagarde, about uh, fragmentation. Uh, we are today experiencing a new sell-off in sovereign bonds, and this might point that the PEP reinvestments and maybe the ECB new commitment is not enough to prevent uh, fragmentation. Has the ECB uh, any news on how the new or the adjusted tool uh, could even look like? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I can only repeat what I have said, which is that uh, we will not tolerate uh, fragmentation that would impair the proper transmission of monetary policy throughout the entire euro area. We do have existing flexibility that is embedded in uh, the reinvestment uh, of our PEP in particular. And uh, we have demonstrated in the past, we will demonstrate if necessary in the future, that we can design, we can deploy the appropriate instrument to prevent that risk from materializing. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question will go to Isabella Bufaki of Il Sole 24 Ore. Isabella, please. Good afternoon, and thank you for taking my questions. Uh, President Lagarde, I have two questions. Uh, one is on the importance of data dependency. Um, and looking beyond uh, September for uh, rate hikes, the co governing council will adjust the monetary policy and it will depend on incoming data. Uh, can we expect then uh, lift offs to come on a quarterly basis, um, coupled with the macroeconomic projections? And my second question is on financial stability because you mentioned it. You mentioned that uh, you mentioned that banks uh, will be facing uh, uh, credit risks increased uh, due to tighter financing conditions. Um, how concerned are you about financial stability in a war situation? Thank you. I have to tell you that I'm concerned about the war. Full stop. But. Your question goes further than that, of course, and the financial stability side of the question, I will defer to my uh, esteemed uh, colleague, friend, and Vice President uh, de Guindos. The first one, um, yes, we are going to pay a lot of attention to data, and we are considering data dependency as one of the key four principles according, according to which we will operate. And obviously, you know, the quarterly projections that we produce are you know, very uh, rich, inform our decisions best. But we cannot be uh, unattentive to developments and to data that we continuously collect, both at the ECB and within the national central banks as well. So we are not going to put ourselves uh, in a straitjacket of only um, taking decisions when we have projections. So with that, I'd like Thank to you hand you much. over. Thank you very much for the, for the question. Uh, you know that in our strategy review, we included a reference that twice per year we would include uh, financial stability considerations in our monetary policy uh, making. And, uh, you know, we did it in December and we have done it uh, now in, 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 in June. And here, you know, the message is quite clear. Uh, the vulnerabilities of the, of the financial system in Europe have been defined in our financial stability review, refer to uh, problems in terms of valuation of, uh, of financial assets, in terms of margins of the banks, and in terms as well of uh, you know, high valuations in some spots of uh, residential real estate. So uh, the conclusion that we have reached that is in, in, included in the, in, the, in the monetary policy statement is that in the short term, the normalization of monetary policy conditions can give rise to additional stress in the short term, but in the medium term, you know, the tightening of financial 
conditions could be positive in order to try to address some of the vulnerabilities. Think about residential real estate. So, you know, this is the main conclusion. And, uh, well, uh, we tried to make uh, an assessment that covers not only the short term, but as well the medium term. Thank you very much, Vice President. That brings our press conference today to a conclusion. Uh, thank you very much for coming here. Can I, I, I would just like to add something, because please. we are here standing in Amsterdam, and my colleague Klaus Nott is with us. And for those of you interested, we had just a fantastic meeting that was organized under the auspices of the uh, Nederlandish uh, Bank uh, under the leadership of, of Klaus. And uh, it's been just a really good, fruitful, and productive experience. Geography matters, and uh, hospitality can help a great deal. So thank you to the Netherlands, and thank you to the National Central Bank of the Netherlands. And our next scheduled press conference is on 21st of July in Frankfurt. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Unless you come back. You can come back.